Um, I'm wearing a skull cap. I think I'm the only one on the panel, even though the panel is called What is a Hat, Not a Hat. I think I'm the only one who is actually wearing a skull cap. Now, what you need to know is that this is a knitted skull cap. I have other friends and colleagues who wear kind of a black skull cap. I have others who wear a larger um, um, velvet skull cap. And I have others who wear black hats. Um, and they all differ in their approach to Judaism. And sometimes the way you cover your head tells us something about the other person. It's kind of like barcoding. <laughs> um, a number of years ago, I lived in the States, and as you know, the medical system in the States is a little different than here in Canada. And um, a friend of mine was a priest, and uh, he told me the following story, that uh, he had gone to his doctor, and um, he finished uh, the examination that he wanted to pay the doctor, because in the United States, that's what you do. And um, the doctor said, no, 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 please, you're a man of the cloth. Um, there's no need at all. And uh, the priest thanked him very much and went on his way. And the next day, a day later, uh, the doctor received in the mail a rosary as a gift. It was very nice. Um, a Buddhist monk came to see the same doctor, and the doctor treated him. And uh, afterwards, uh, the, the monk wanted to pay, and the doctor said, no, please, you're, you're a person of religion, and uh, we know that you don't have many uh, resources, and so, please, it's my pleasure. Um, and so a few days went by, and he received in the mail some bells as a way of thanking. And um, the same thing actually happened with the rabbi. And the rabbi was treated, and the doctor said, please, rabbi, no need to, to compensate me. I, I feel honored and respected to treat you. And a few days later, the rabbi sent him another rabbi. <laughs> A few years ago, I convened a conference, a theology conference, with um, Roman Catholic priests, and everyone was supposed to bring their own joke. Well, it turns out that the Roman Catholics tell the same joke, only at the end it's the priest who sends the other priest. Okay, and it turns out that Protestants tell the same joke, only the minister sends another minister. And I'm sure that if we were to expand it, to other religious traditions, what we would find is that we all know how to laugh about ourselves. Excuse me, about ourselves, but it wouldn't be appropriate for me to tell that joke another way. Like uh, Reverend Hamilton, should I tell the joke about the rabbi and the priest flying on the plane? What do you think? Is that kosher? <laughs> what do you think? You'll tell me before I finish, okay? <laughs> My wife said not to. <laughs> but a few years ago, I was listening to a radio broadcast about Lake Wobegon, you know, the little, the, the right, okay? And Garrison Keillor told about a story about this woman who came into his church in Lake Wobegon. And he said, you know, we're German Lutherans here. And she came in, and she was wearing a big cross. She was out of place. And when the minister spoke, she kept going, Amen! And he said, she was really out of place. We all knew she was a stranger. Now, this is within one religious tradition. And I was laughing because, of course, I recognize the same things that go on in my synagogue, and we know that there are differences as well in the way people practice their religion, even though they claim that it's the same religion. So 
in Judaism, we often think of a religious civilization, which really means a fusion of belonging, believing, and behaving. Uh, so you could belong to, you could belong to the Jewish community, but you could be an Ashkenazi, a European Jew, or a Sephardi, a Jew who, oh, whose origins go back to Spain and North Africa. Or you could be a Mizrahi Jew, whose origins go back to the Arabian Peninsula, to Yemen. And you would have different traditions, even though you saw yourself as part of the Jewish community, which is why the Jewish community could go and work on the rescue of Ethiopian Jews. We saw them as part of us, even though they were very different from Western European Jews. You can talk about belief. And Every religion has its principles, but there's also a penumbra around the principles, and it's in the penumbra that we get confused often. Or we could talk about our behavior, but we discovered that different religious traditions, depending on where they're from, may be distinct, even though it seems like it's the same religion. So imagine if you're working in a workplace and you have two people who both claim to be from the same religious tradition, but they apply their religious tradition, they live their religious tradition in different ways. It could be that as a Muslim, someone's coming from Guyana. And that's very different than someone who's coming from, um, let's say, um, one of the Arabian Peninsula countries. And yet they each claim, and correctly, that they are practicing their religious tradition. And you have to work with that as well. Um, I have a friend who's an Ethiopian Jewish woman. She's married to an Egyptian Jewish man. His mother came from the Jewish community of Turkey. His father came from the Russian Jewish community. So which aspect of Judaism and which aspect of culture are they going to express in their own lives? And and what does she and her husband, what do they carry? So we have these, you know, these melange uh, qualities in our employees, in our staff, in ourselves. We appear to be better. One of my um, friends uh, has uh, written a paper, Irving Abella, uh, called When Jews Became White. You know, there was a time that Jews were not hired by Bell Telephone, by any of the insurance companies, by any of the banks. They could not practice medicine at Toronto General, at Toronto East, at Princess Margaret, um, at Sick Kids, among others. We were outsiders. Over time, Canada opened up. Jews became white. So it's very hard now for some people to imagine Jews as feeling a sense that there is prejudice directed against them. I assure you that if you talk privately to members of the Jewish community, they will identify those things. They will identify prejudice. Even though, if you're a person of color, if you're a minority in Canada, if you look at where Jews in Canada are placed, you would say there's no difference between those white people and those white people. And yet if you were to ask on the inside, Jews would certainly articulate a difference. So I think we are better. We, we certainly appear to be better. Um, our places of worship now have people of diverse origins, um, diverse color, diverse belief. Our neighborhoods sometimes are more diverse, even though there are Italian neighborhoods and Portuguese neighborhoods and Greek neighborhoods, etc. 
we know that there are pockets within those neighborhoods of people who come and live different religious lives and have different cultural traditions. Um, we see it in the workplace and we see it as well in media, um, the TV broadcasters, um, little mosques on the prairie, things like that. We see it in food, in the malls, right? And not just in the ethnic neighborhoods, but in malls where you can get Mexican food, Indian food, Chinese food, Greek food, Jamaican food, South Asian food. You can go and get a bagel or a baguette, right? Did I miss somebody else's food that you particularly like? Haggis. What? Haggis. Haggis. <laughs> you know, last year, we, we have for three years at our synagogue, if you're a Baptist, if you're a Southern Baptist, don't listen. For three years at our synagogue, we have had a scotch night. And they bring out kosher haggis. Okay, and they sing. Okay, uh, speaking as a vegetarian, it doesn't do much for me. Um, we are more comfortable in different ways with the public expression of religion. Um, it doesn't have to be private anymore. When I was in university, um, I was among the first group of young Jews that began to wear a head covering in public. An earlier generation would do it in private, but not in public. An earlier generation of Muslims would cover their hair differently than Muslims today do, than Sikhs might here in Canada. We are more willing to accept public displays. Um, we are, in some ways, more secular which means we're more polytheistic, which means we're more accepting. And at the same time, we are, certainly in pockets, more religious and more committed to the way we express ourselves in that religious life. And that leads to polarization. I'm going to be finishing up quickly. Um, differences remain. They are deep. Um, we want more integration. Um, we want more communication, um, but we took a path of Abraham group to Israel and Palestine, and we had people who got up and said, this is the first time I've ever had a serious conversation with someone from another religious tradition. So I think that we're missing opportunities at work, um, and that's because of fear, reluctance, and to some extent a lack of opportunity. So I think you need to have fact sheets about different religions and what they practice and do so that people in your offices, in your small areas, um, have the opportunity to understand something about others. I think you need to use this book. Now you should know the booklet that you have here Reverend Hamilton and I said, gee, we've never seen this before. We work in this area. How many of you here have ever seen the book before? Well, that's a good percentage. That's like the people who responded to the senator. <laughs> so you need to use this material. Um, there's a wonderful book called How to Be a Perfect Guest. What do you do when you go to somebody's place of worship? You should have that somewhere in the office for people who are going to be invited by somebody else in the office to something else. But I want to say that in the end, it's not going to be the laws. Some of you have read um, or know of the book Practical Wisdom by Barry Schwartz and Kenneth Sharp. Uh, Schwartz wrote the book originally about the paradox of choice. This book, Practical Wisdom, talks about the limitations of law about the limitations of rules. Because the reality is you need to apply a certain amount of practical wisdom to know when, where, how to act in a particular situation. And that comes through trying to cultivate certain things like virtues, tolerance of understanding, 
of acceptance. And that comes through modeling as well as through teaching. So we need to know how to read, how to listen, how to carefully attune ourselves to others. Because otherwise you become celibate, you retreat into yourself, into a private relationship with God. We need to as well figure out how to celebrate the diversity that we have among us. Thank you. My work at the Canadian Race Relations Foundation is uh, a work that is really a passion that deals with race relations, with making all of us Canadians active in our society, contributing to the betterment of Canada that is already a model for so many other countries all over the world. When I joined the foundation back in 2006, we talked about race relations. In previous years, in my other uh, positions, we talked about cultural communities and interaction. Today, the foundation has a major initiative that deals with interfaith dialogue. The reason I'm uh, making reference to this is that religion is a major reality in Canadian society today. And the senator earlier on, so eloquently talked about this diversity of Canadian society, the religious diversity, and this is the focus of today's discussion. The link, the relationship between culture and religion. The first question that I'll be asking uh, the uh, panelists, and uh, the format that we will follow, we have an hour, the format we will uh, follow here, I will address a primary question to each of the uh, panel uh, members and then we will uh, receive your uh, uh, questions and answers. The first question is the following. If you read the media, the uh, print uh, or, or watch the news, we always hear about uh, situations where, when they talk about major incidents, for example, uh, the, the uh, unfortunate uh, uh, and, and the sad uh, crime situation that was uh, committed uh, by a Montreal-based family where there is a talk about honor killing and this relationship between culture and religion. So the first question is, many consider culture and religion as indistinguishable or inseparable or similar. Are they different? Are they similar? And if they are, how? And I'll be addressing this uh, question to Winston. Thank you. Good morning. And I think the format is that I have to come up here to answer the questions. But before I do, I just want to Greetings for myself, good morning to my fellow panelists. I want to say uh, shalom, uh, good morning, and namaste. And good morning to one and every, uh, to, to everyone in the room. Um, I also would like, given that I'm the first person coming up here, I would also recognize Skills for Change for doing this today, and it is a great uh, event.